Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture in this benighted age, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And visit Patreon.com slash VMSPod or PayPal.me slash VMSPod to make a one-time or recurring donation and Help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. I spent the weekend at Small Press Expo down in Maryland, where I got a bunch of great podcasts in with uh, Chris Ware, Annie Koyama, and Sylvia Nickerson. Uh, you'll hear those over the next few weeks. And I also got to see some past and some future pod guests and pick up some comics, catch up with other pals, and beat the living hell out of the hotel treadmill on successive mornings, as is my want. Um, I also got to hear from a listener who really digs the show and gets a lot out of the conversations, even the non-comics ones. And that was a, a pretty rewarding moment for me. I, I was pretty gratified by that. That said, I um, I also got walloped with a sort of burnout or or existential dread by the time Sunday rolled around after I did a couple of shows that morning. And I decided to postpone one of my pod sessions for a couple of weeks so I could just get home a few hours early and, and decompress before a bizarre and difficult week that's upcoming. Um, and this one was with a guest who he's a really good cartoonist. I didn't want to half-ass things with him and and you know just felt like I wouldn't have done a good job that that session and and would have would have let him down would have let you down etc so um so that's a balancing act of having an artistic pursuit and and having work um this guest this week on the other hand I did just fine with and that contrast of of well day job and and you know the side passion thing is actually part of what we get into my guest this time is Amor Tolls. He is the author of the wonderful novels A Gentleman in Moscow and Rules of Civility. Uh, they're both available in good bookstores everywhere. Uh, I enjoyed Rules, and I love Gentleman in Moscow, which which had tones and, and threads from a whole bunch of my favorite works. Uh, Montaigne, The Leopard by Lampedusa, Chess Story by Stefan Zweig, which I will note Amor tells me he has never read, um, so it's all in my imagination, as well as the great Russians, particularly Tolstoy. Um, see, Gentleman in Moscow is about a Russian count who uh, returns to Russia during the revolution 100 years ago after living in exile for reasons that come out over the course of the book. Um, the communists want to execute him, but he's still got some juice, basically. So he's consigned to spend the rest of his days in the luxurious Moscow hotel where he's been living since his return. But he doesn't get to stay in the, the ritzy suite he was accustomed to and, and has to make do as an employee of the hotel living in a cramped attic. Um, it's it's a wonderful book. It it tells this amazing story of his life and, and Russian times over the next 30 or so years. The Count is this is amazingly compelling character, and Tolls brings the various eras to life beautifully, and the, the characters who come and go through the hotel over the, the decades. And he reflects the eras through the, the changes in the hotel as, as communism sweeps Russia, and then what it means as Russia is trying to impress the rest of the world. Um, A Gentleman in Moscow also has this really intricate plot that's, that's just perfectly constructed uh, with a gorgeous series of payoffs. So it's not like it's just some um, some jewel of a novel. It, it's really got a lot to it, a lot of a lot of propulsion. It's um, 
it's just wonderful. I, I enjoy the living hell out of it. That said, we don't actually talk much about it during the episode. And part of that is because it's it's got this propulsive sort of plot and all these these little elements. I didn't want to ruin the experience for, for a new reader, but I adored A Gentleman in Moscow. And if you're a listener of this show, you're probably going to dig the hell out of it. So give it a read. Oh, I also dug Amor's first book, Rules of Civility, which I read after Moscow. Um, very different novel, different structure. There are threads connecting them, which Amor and I get into. Rules of Civility focuses on a young woman making her way in New York City of 1937, exploring bohemia, high society, publishing, all sorts of points in between. It also has a well-crafted plot and an interesting symmetrical structure, and it takes the reader in some unexpected directions. Now, the thing is, in addition to writing these insanely entertaining novels, Amor's also got the story of having a non-writing career for many years, uh, and only publishing these books in his 40s and early 50s. So I was really interested in talking with him, not just about his life as a writer, but but that progression of his life and how he was able to, to find the time and motivation to write while holding a, a demanding and rewarding job and helping raise a family. Um, you know, just to make myself feel bad for accomplishing so much less. Uh, anyway, it's an interesting conversation. He's had a, a really uh, neat life, and I'm happy he broke away from that career to, to get back to his first love. I adore both of the novels. I'm looking forward to, to what he does next, and I'm awfully glad he gave me some time for a conversation. And we will get into what he's working on next over the course of our uh, our next hour. Now, as far as caveats go, uh, phone rang once or twice. Otherwise, it's just New York City street noise. Oh, I also want to thank the cartoonist Tom Tomorrow for helping connect me with Amor uh, and vouching for me as a non-crazy person. Um, I saw a picture of, of Tom Tomorrow and Amor on Tom's Instagram feed and, and kind of jumped from there to pitching him and and that's how this all came together. Here's Amor's bio. There's a longer version in the show notes page and on his website. Amor Tolls is the author of the New York Times bestsellers Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow, which was named one of the best books of 2016 by the Chicago Tribune, The Washington Post, The Philadelphia Inquirer, The San Francisco Chronicle, and NPR. His short story cycle, The Temptations of Pleasure, was published in the Paris Review in 1989. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Amor Tolls. So you, you started out, like coming out of college, you, you, were, you were studying, well, you wanted to be a writer. That's right. And you ended up going... Well, not into writing for 20 plus years or so. That's right. Had you been writing during that span? Which span? The professional life that didn't involve publishing span, or were you... I began uh, writing fiction as a kid, yeah. so basically first grade. Uh, I learned almost how to read and how to write simultaneously, or my interest in reading and writing began simultaneously, and so they moved in parallel. Mm -hmm through my youth and to my teens, at college and in graduate school, um, you know, read, write, read, write, and keep moving back and forth and drawing from what I read to influence how I was writing and, you know, in a youthful way. And uh, so that was my ambition from the beginning, was, was to write fiction. And when I finished uh, graduate school at Stanford, and I studied literature at Yale, I studied literature at Stanford um, and wrote fiction at both places. Um, but when I got to uh, New York, uh, with the intention of writing a book, um, I pretty I pretty quickly um, was a little frustrated with being alone all day mm. uh, as a young person, you know, 25, and I needed money, you know, to get by. And so I knew I had to have a job if I was going to write fiction, um, and I just sort of looked at the landscape of my friends who were artists and waiters or artists and bartenders or artists and... Homeless. Yeah, or, or yeah, well, that, but, or artists and working in the um, the wings of their field. So I had friends who were painters who were receptionists at galleries, and I had friends who were writers who were, you know, personal assistants to editors, and you know that kind of the wings or, or fact checkers, the New Yorker, yeah. and 
adjacent. Yeah, and I found that, that, that neither of those strategies seemed to work very well for their art, meaning, you know, my friends who were bartenders made good money, but they, like, were up till 2 in the morning, and then they would go home with somebody, a stranger, and, you know, drinking, and would wake up at you know, noon, and they weren't getting any much, much art done. And my friends who were kind of working in the wings of their field, I found that they would get home just exhausted by their field. You know, if you're working all day as an assistant to an editor, you were reading stuff all the time from the trash pile or whatever, and you just got home and you, the last thing you wanted to do was sit in front of a computer. Right. So I decided instead that I would uh, look for work as a, as a researcher in the investment arena, which I knew something about, and um, seemed like it would be an intellectually stimulating field and uh, maybe better compensated in the long run and, and would maybe leave just as much time to do art on the side as those other options. And uh, so I began looking for work as an analyst, and a friend of mine had started his own firm. He had begun investing as a kid and was working alone. So I joined him, and 21 years later, we were still working side by side. And uh, so from as I really, we began working together, and as the firm began to grow, um, I stopped writing for 10 years. And so from the age of 25 to 35, where uh, I was, um, you know, we were focused on refining our craft, finding colleagues, finding clients, uh, you know. And building. Yeah, building, being entrepreneurs. And it was a great fun. You know, it was, it was very intellectually satisfying. Uh, we had a lot of fun working together. It was fun to solve the problems of building the business. It was fun ultimately working with our colleagues and our clients. Um, so I didn't. It was, I was okay not writing for that 10 years in that it was kind of a, a good thing. But in the back of my mind, I had this great anxiety about uh, sort of fear that I would not go back to it. Mm -hmm. And um, and so that's what kind of hung over me. And, and, and in the, so in the back of my mind, I knew that if I didn't actually write a book that I felt proud of by the time I was, let's say, 50, that I would probably end up bitter as a grown-up. And so, uh, or in my old age... So at the age of 35, I decided, okay, I'm going to write a book uh, in my spare, you know, in the free time. Yeah, quote, unquote, free time. In my quote, unquote, free time. And um, so I spent seven years. I wrote a novel that I didn't like, and uh, I set that aside, and but took, you know, uh, reflected on that book and what its strengths and weaknesses were, and, and walked away with a couple of conclusions about how to do a better job. Because I'd never I'd written tons of short fiction at that point, and uh, but I'd never, and I'd read a million novels, but I had not written a novel, and, and so I made some classic mistakes. And but I, I reflected on that, and I mean, guess buildings roman about a guy who does college MFA. Well, and then it wasn't goes that. Okay. No, that was not my mistake. That was not my mistake. You know, I would have if, if I if I'd done that, I probably would have loved it and submitted it. To you know, and later regretted it. You yes, know what I mean? That's the, the fifty and bitter. Again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's the nature of that project: is you fall in love with it, and you know you're excited. But no, mm -hmm. I, it was much more. Uh, uh, it was a project was much more um, ambitious and foreign to me, and, and, and that was part of the problem, I guess, at the time. Uh, it, it was really the, the two major things that I walked away with from that were that I had not outlined that book, and partly given my time constraints, and partly given what I like to what I am trying to achieve in the novel, that proved to be a real problem. And, and you know, what I, for me, and I, different writers are trying to achieve different things, and different writers may be trying to achieve, achieve different things within, you know, from book to book. But for me so far, uh, one of the things I'm trying, or I like to, to pursue in the shape of a novel is, is, is kind of the, the opportunity for a novel to be symphonic in structure, in a way, which is that... Um, sort of like a uh, symphony of Mozart's or Beethoven's, I, 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 the novel has the capacity to have movements, in essence, and to have motifs which are repeated over the course of the narrative. And much in the way that in a, in a symphony, that motif might be picked up by different instruments over the course of the symphony and played at different tempos and with different strengths of feeling, um, that, you know, the same thing. In the novel, the motif can resurface triggering different emotions and in different styles and, um, and sort of creating these uh, ways and w reverberations, you know, mm -hmm. so that when you hear it or read it in the middle of the book, it recalls these aspects of earlier in the book and kind of holds together. And then ultimately, uh, uh, and you can have these different flights of, of feeling 
evoked by the different instruments and by whether it's a solo of the oboe or the entire string section suddenly coming in. And, and I feel the novel can do those things. And, and, and in addition, uh, you know, I, the novel, I think, can have this element of like the end of a Mozart or a Beethoven symphony, which it kind of builds after all this, these various movements and you know, builds to a crescendo. And you have the final note, and there's this great feeling of like, ah, yes, that's it. That's the end of that symphony. It's where it should end. It shouldn't go on further. It shouldn't have ended shorter. And there's this great feeling of satisfaction about that. And, and I think the book can do that too. And, and so uh, in, in as much as that's an ambition um, the, that's very hard to achieve without planning, I don't think you can. Yeah. So, so, so the outline ends up being a tool for that. Um, I, I'd say I, one of the things else that's more nuanced in a way and that it took me a while to to learn or, or to reflect on, which is that I think, for me, one of the reasons the outline is very effective as a tool is because if you know what's going to happen in great detail, as I tend to before I start writing chapter one, what that really allows me to do, I, it's sort of counterintuitive, is that, that, that organizing principle of defining every chapter, the sequence of events, the characters in their background, the settings, you know, the, the thematic developments all laid out in a very detailed outline, which sounds very kind of uh, Aristotelian. I was going to say Germanic. But, yeah, but yeah, yeah, you yeah. can pick your term. But, you know, yes, the same notion and um, or type A or whatever, how, you know, or, or, mm -hmm. or left brain, I guess. Whatever you, however you want to put it, the, the, the counterintuitive element of that is that when you've done that, what it does is it actually allows you, it frees you up within the chapter to do the reverse, which is that since you know what's going to happen and how this chapter fits into the grander landscape and who the people are, what the setting is, um, it allows you instead to really focus on the, the language of the sentences, the poetry of the sentences, the, the surprises that might surface, the imagery that you're, uh, you know, uh, that you're trying to, to pin down and, and to, to bring to fruition. So, so the, the organization allows the, the other side of the artistic sensibility really to take over and, uh, and move quite freely, you know, which is really the goal, right, is to hit sort of this moment of, of intuitive bliss, you know, where the sort of the creative elements are surfacing uh, and that you're capturing that in language. Um, and, and ironically, I, I, that finds that's a very good balance for me, is to have that outline uh, allows that to happen in a way which I think is more effective for me. So, so that was one thing. And the other thing was that um, I really thought that in looking at that failed book seven years into it, that uh, it was um, that, that some of the parts I wrote in the first year I still loved and still seemed very vibrant and fresh. And, and there were parts that I had labored over in years four, five, and six that I still hated, you know, yeah. and uh, after three years of work or whatever, paragraphs or and so I sort of felt, you know, there is something uh, about that first year of the effort that is lighter and more where the invention and the lightness of touch and the inspiration are kind of brightest. And so when I set that book aside, I was still on my job. But what I decided was, all right, I'm going to write a book, but I'm going to outline it in great detail. And I'm going to try to write the first draft in one year. Mm -hmm. And so Rules of Civility was the product of that mission. Um, what was the gap between finishing that first novel and then the process of beginning Rules? That's a good question. Um, I would say, let's see, uh, I almost have to do the math in my head now. I would be... Um, Seven years would make you 42 about when yeah, you Yeah, well, yeah, well, so, so I was, tw well, no, I was 25 to 30. You're right, 25 to... I was, yeah. So yeah, twenty five to thirty five. Yeah, to, I was to say twenty five to thirty five. I wasn't writing thirty five to forty two. I wrote this book and uh, that didn't work. And so maybe it was a couple of years later, um, and, and that I started Rules of Civility. Now, partly that's because, as I say, there was a planning process involved in that, and um, and I spent a couple of years outlining that book, and, and I began that book in January first, two thousand six. Mm -hmm. Um, began writing that book, and, and not coincidentally, that book opens on New Year's Eve, and that book ends uh, 12 months later on New Year's Eve, kind of in essence the, the, of the following year, because that's when I finished writing the yeah. book, the first draft. So I, did, I wrote this that dra uh, draft over the first year, and this is kind of a, a crazy part of this, but but um, 
that book has 26 chapters because I, des I designed it that way because the year has 52 weeks. And I wanted to write a chapter for a week, edit that chapter for a week, and then move on just to keep the forward momentum going, that lightness of touch. And, and so, yeah, the 26 chapters, 52 weeks, you know, and wrapping it up on New Year's Eve of that, of that year, 2006. But then I revised that book from beginning to end three times. And that took a couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, Had you been connected to editors in the publishing world? during that time, or were you pretty much doing this entirely on your own? For Rules of Civility? Yeah. Well, Rules of Civility, um, I, I wrote the first draft, and then I revised around, and then I shared it with some friends, and through that process, ended up getting an agent, and then I did another round of revision after talking about the book with my agent, um, and then submitted that you know, so whatever that is, and then did another round of revisions in the okay. aftermath. So you, you began to get involved in the publishing world, yeah. but, but not until you'd already finished Rules? Yes, Rules yeah. was in a very good shape when it was mm -hmm. sold. It was, you know, it was ultimately sold at auction, and, yeah. and uh, you know, Viking Penguin won that auction. And, and so, but at that point, it was a very strong yeah. uh, manuscript. And, you know, as an aside, you know, I get people will ask me, for advice or young writers or old writers who've never submitted books. And that's clearly a, a new, a newer aspect of the publishing world. I mean, newer in the sense of over hundreds of years, but mm -hmm. which is that editors today are required to edit far more books than they were in the early part of the 20th century. And so they don't have the time to take, you know, raw talent and yeah. bring it to, you know, foster it, you know, uh, and there's a big premium paid on on books that are are almost there or yeah. there, and um, and so the agents have become editors yeah. in the modern era, you know. But so yeah, so my book kind of went through a similar process in that sense. Yeah, how closely did that final version correlate to the outline that you started with? Um, very, yeah. uh, you know. I mean, there's always events that are occurring over the course of the book that are that were not anticipated and uh, that you did not anticipate, and that you're the, the in practical terms, the the biggest difference between the original draft of the outline and the way the book comes out is the biggest difference is actually being integrated into the outline itself as evolving because because the outline is a living document. So you write chapter one and two, or I do. I write chapter one. I write chapter two. I write chapter three, four, five, and in the course of that, I am having discoveries about. The course of events, the characters' personalities, the 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 thematic developments. Uh, so, as I'm writing the first half of the book, the second half of the outline is evolving mm -hmm. quite dramatically. Okay, so it's not a fixed, fixed. No, no, you know, and it, you're, you're learning, and so. But but as I say, it's becoming now a part of the outline, yeah. right? And, and so, and and to some degree, that's um, a lot of that part of the, the, the back half of the outline evolving, a lot of that is actually not so much this changing course is that it's getting richer as a preparatory document in that you'll write something in the first half and say, oh, okay, yes, when we get to chapter 20 and this is happening, this should be the conversation which is occurring there. I wrote this conversation here while I'm drafting chapter 5, but it doesn't belong here. This belongs much later in the book. So you push that back into the outline or you, you write a, a, an event and you say, ah, you know, exactly. This is later in the book when they have this. They should be back in this room or, yeah. or this, you know, occurrence should be remembered at that moment or this image should be recalled or whatever. So, so as I say, a lot of the back half of the outline if getting thicker is, is not necessarily a veer in direction from what you had planned. But it's a much richer sense of yeah. what uh, that's going to be. It's a fuller, be. more detailed thing than you start with the, the skeleton. E, of the very yes, beginning. exactly. No, but as I say, within that, there are also variations where you're like, okay, this, this, uh, I didn't anticipate that this is actually what the characters should do. And, you know, in that book, Rules of Civility, you know, to me, the, one of the most prominent examples in my mind is that, that the, uh, the main character's roommate and sort of crony is this tough character named Eve. And, Midway through Rules of Civility, she abandons New York with the intention of, of going home to her family in Chicago. But she's a total troublemaker and and doesn't like to be told what to do and uh, doesn't like conventional behavior. And and I was literally writing the sequence of events where she's arriving and by train in Chicago, and the family has come to meet her to take her back to Indiana or whatever. And um, and as I'm writing the scene, I was like, Oh my God, she would never ever get off that train. She would never happen. And 
And so, like, kind of on the spot, she doesn't. The family gets there, and she doesn't get off the train. And then they, you know, eventually they figure out that she's made her way to Los Angeles. You know, in 1938. And I ended up writing six short stories that follow her to Los Angeles, called Even Hollywood. You know, this sort of small collection of short stories that describe her first six months in Hollywood in 1938. But that was kind of, you know, that's a version of that kind of. Um, a veering surprise, which is fun, you know, for the writer, of course, you know, when that happens. Is there any respect to which your, the analyst skills that you developed at work played into writing? No. No? Okay, I, I wasn't sure at all. Cause it, or did they stymie you from, you know, things that you thought No. about making art? Okay. I would say it's the opposite, right, which is that the, my, my natural, I, you know, I studied history and yeah. philosophy in college alongside literature, and my natural analytical abilities in writing essays about Melville, you know, strengthened my life as an analyst. Gotcha. But it's not like my life as an analyst that yeah, strengthened sure my life as a writer. Any aspect of that. So yeah. not, not including the work experience, experience, yeah. but just the skills that developed from it. No. Good. Um, but just that, that does, I'd say that desire to make the jump, was it essentially fueled by the, I need to do this before I'm 50, I need to, to well, which we can call a midlife I, crisis. I mean, I wrote, but, I wrote Rules of Civility while I was on the job, and and, uh, and that book then came out, and when it became a bestseller, that's when I, re- I stepped down from the firm and, and began, and I wrote Gentleman Moscow as a full-time employee, I'm sorry, of myself, I'm a yeah, full-time, yeah. <laughs> full-time writer, excuse me. Amor told to not see, employee, that's an unemployed person. Um, and, and so, uh, but... Um, but as I say, yeah, it, it was the, the, it was more that I wanted to make sure that I wrote a book I had admi- I, I felt good about. Mm-hmm. And when I finished Rules of Civility, I I was I I knew when it was done. Yep, this is this is a good book. You know, this is worth. Like I say, I didn't even submit the first book. You know, and, mm-hmm. and so, but that was a case where I was like, yeah, this this is gonna this is worth submitting, and and I think has a very good shot at at finding an audience. And so, um, uh, but that that was kind of the big hurdle. Yeah. So having done that, that that made that kind of appease that anxiety. Mm-hmm. The fact that the book then came out and did well just gave me an opportunity then to shift gears more profoundly. And did you have trepidation? No, about not making the jump. And again, it's not. It wasn't a very courageous sequence of events because the book had come out and been a success while I still had the job. Yeah, I know, I'm hit. Right. But, yeah, you know, you I know. still figure there's the holy crap. I'm not going to be. In an office. Yeah, no, I, be, I know. I was, it was fun. I loved yeah. my job, but I'd been there for 21 years, yeah. so I was ready for a change. Mm-hmm. Um, having more freedom and time to write, was it something you, you had to get used to? No. Uh, yeah. you, know, uh, you know, anybody, uh, you know, I, I sat on a, a panel with, um, with R.J. Palacio, who wrote Wonder, uh, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, uh, the YA book, of enormous, successfully YA, YA book, and... Um, and Lee Child, who's also a, a, a close acquaintance of mine, um, who you know created Jack Reacher, and the three of us were on a panel, and, and somebody said, you know, after we had talked for forty minutes, he said, you know, you, you don't really strike me, any of you, as the suffering writer type. What's you know, what's with that? You know, how, where's where's the anxiety <laughs> and the frustration and the suffering? And and we kind of looked at each other, and, and the and the, what came out of that, we kind of all laughed, three of us, because all three of us had. Jobs, you know, <laughs> right? I mean, Lee was was a television uh, director, uh, producer until he was fired in his thirties in England. And uh, R.J. Palacio designed book covers, and it still does today, I think. Um, and so, it, as a you know, for us, you know, we've been in we've been in meetings that never ended, and we've you know we've had to fire people, and we've had to be sitting through you know training sessions and dealt with compliance issues and, you know, clients who are mad and, you know, what, you know, all, which is all part of, it's fine. That's a part of life in a corporation or in, in, in contemporary business. But I was saying, so for any of, for the three of us, you know, sitting at a desk and writing, yeah, it's a not huge luxury. Oh my God. You know? <laughs> so yeah, so no, we, not, not, none of us look back with, you know, with great, uh, you know, longing for those days when we were in meetings, you know? Yeah. I managed to go into my early forties before I ever had to make a PowerPoint. Okay, right. Well, there you go. Yeah, which I, I felt... Yeah, that's generational, though, probably. True. Yeah, now they teach it in high school. Yeah, that's... that's I, I managed to come of age, you know, again, a little bit younger than you, but enough that I, yeah, I managed yeah, to skip You missed that, that one. Yeah, right, yeah. It was just early 40s. I'm like, God yeah. damn it. Now I actually have to give a presentation like this. Yes, you know? right, exactly. And at least you come back with the lessons of uh, don't put every single word up on the screen yes. that you're actually going to say. That's right. I'd attended enough of these to, yes. to understand. But, that doesn't work. Yeah. Well, that's that's a uh, insecurity thing on some right. people's part in right. case they forget anything they can yeah. Look up at the screen and yeah, keep right. going. But um, tell me about with a gentleman in Moscow. The 
the process of outlining and the process of writing when it came to, to that in terms of the, the, the time and where it fell in relation to rules of civility and, and that process? Um, How long did it take to outline it? And at what yeah, point did you begin it, it was a very similar yeah. sequence of events. Um, in, in both cases, the, the, the notion for the book is a sentence or two. And, and in both cases, the notion dated years back. And so I think I had the, the premise of rules of civility. I had come up with that when I was about 26. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when I sat down to then write a new book with an outline and, you know, this process I was just describing, uh, you kind of go through your catalog of all the various ideas that I've had. And, and that one surfaced, and, um, and then I pursued it. Now, in, in, in that case, I... And I remember this quite vividly when I decided, okay, I'm going to do th that story about the woman at the opening of the Walker Evans show where she recognizes a friend from the 30s in a photograph, and which is kind of the premise of, of Rules of Civility. And, and in the course of 72 hours, I had written out the key events that occur in the book, you know, the, 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 uh, the scaffolding, as it were. So, okay, you know, this is the characters are going to be involved. This is the sequence of events. This is the surprises. Or, you know, this is the, the conflicts or whatever. All very quickly that came to me. Um, and then you start the outlining process in greater detail. Same thing with The Gentleman in Moscow. I had had the idea for it while I was in a hotel as a professional uh, years before. Um, and the weekend that I had the idea, years before I actually wrote the book, um, I was in Geneva in a hotel, but I went like the next day to Paris where I had a weekend in Paris before my meetings began again as a professional. And um, in the course of that 72 hours from the night in Geneva and the three nights later in Paris, I wrote uh, you know, a handful of pages. I wrote all the key characters and events of Gentleman in Moscow in very fast um, mm -hmm. shape. But then I spent a couple of years taking that scaffolding and turning it into an outline that was... Uh, Significant. I mean, you know, where it's in the end, the outline is you know, 40 or 50 pages long or something like that. And you've really dug into, you, know, you kind of know these key events, but that's not enough. Or, you know, you really dug into what is the setting and what's the sequence and when does show and so and so show up? When do they recur? And, and what is the nature of the relationship and how does it evolve and all those kinds of things. So, so that took a couple of years, let's say, to prepare that outline. And then um, it took me about 18 months in that case to write the first draft, uh, which uh, it's a much, you know, it's a book is about 50 percent longer than rules of civility. So I don't, yeah. you know, fault myself too much for that. And then again, I revised that from beginning to end two to, you know, two to three times roughly, um, but under a shorter time constraint in that case. Yeah. And our editor's pushing you a little bit more for, uh, so give us more of that Amor Tolls feeling, but a little faster this time? Yeah, well, now, but, but they, in this case, what happened is that I had submitted the, I, I wrote the first, and I, I don't share my first draft with anybody while I'm writing it. So mm -hmm. not even my wife. I will write the whole thing and then do a round of revision before anybody sees it, and then I'll share it with, you know, about five or six people and uh, and to get all at the same time, and then over the course of, of 60 days, we'll try to get feedback from the six of them over a series of lunches where they kind of, where I interview them about yeah. their experience with the book. And uh, I then retreat with that, kind of my sense of their feedback, and with my own instincts at that point, and start to plan, how would I change this? And, and then I sit down and go really go through it page by page, or you know, after kind of rethinking it a little bit. And so, um, and one of those six people is my editor at Viking, Paul Slovak. Um, and uh, so then I'll, then I'll take it and go to work. In this case, what ended up happening is that I, I, did the, I handed it in. I got the feedback. I did a round of, maybe it was right then, that Paul said, um, you know, in this case, Viking was, was so pleased with that draft that, you know, they wanted to published the book in September, and it was, I think I handed in this draft in October, so, so they said, listen, you know, we can go to others two ways, but we think this would be great for next September. Do you have the bandwidth and stamina to do two rounds of revision, uh, bef you know, in, by, yeah. you buy, and it's really, they give you, then, then it's five months, you know, because... They need the final draft to be in place six months before publication, any, any book today, and so uh, in order to get the whole thing in motion. 
And so that would mean, you know, final draft due by the 1st of March, roughly. And so the, go the question was, can you do a round, get it back to us by the end of January? And then, you know, we'll give you quick feedback, and then you would get a round back to us, you know, by the beginning of March or something like that. So, or mid-March, maybe they gave me. And so maybe it was mid-January or mid-March. But anyways, so that, and they left it up to me. They said, you know, if not, we'll... Move it another year. Yeah, we'll put it in another year, or we'll consider doing it in June. And you know, it's, but I, at the time, I felt strong enough about the first draft and had enough clarity about where I thought I was going to make changes that um, that I was like, okay, yeah, let's 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 shoot for that, you know, and uh, I'll commit to that. And, and so um, I did, a, you know, much more accelerated rounds of revision. And revision for me is quite significant. I throw out a lot of the book. I write a lot of material from scratch. Uh, there's been not a page escapes change, mm -hmm. you know, when I go through the revision process. Usually what happens to me is, is I'll take, let's say if the book is, you know, whatever it is, let's say it's 300 pages, in my first round of revision, I'm going to cut that back to 220, let's say, you know, 225 or something, and then add 75 pages of ma new material back. So, so in the cutting down, basically you take the 300-page book and turn it into a 225-page version of itself, which is that everything that was there at the beginning is still there, but in a more concentrated form. And then you start to layer in new material, you know, throughout the book, you know, expanding characters or scenes or adding a chapter, what have you. And, um, and then I might do another version, a second or another round of that in the second revision. So it, so it is quite intense, but, but I, I, in that case, I was like quite happy to do it in a shorter period of time. And the process works for you. Well, it worked in that case, yeah. Well, two books so far. They've they both yes, they've survived hit pretty well. Yeah. Um, the, the the writing instructors or professors you had back in like college and grad school, did they have any sort of it's about time when when Rules of Civility came out? Was there any sense of you know um, you know my belated, uh, thank yous or congratulations? Uh, yeah, no, not really. <laughs> I, you know, for, I must say that you know, and again, I think different writers are different. I, for me, the the most valuable thing about about writing fiction in college and in, in graduate school was really the reading classes I was taking, not sure. the writing classes. Mm -hmm. I did, I did, I was in seminar. I mean, it was in, in workshop environments and both at both Yale and Stanford. Um, but I, you know, studying literature at both places was where I learned the most. Um, the, 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 the person that, that the, the, the event you're describing that had the greatest, uh, that stood out for me was that my, when I was at Yale, uh, Peter Matheson, the great American both novelist and, and uh, naturalist and nonfiction writer, traveler, uh, he came and visited the university, and, and I was in his seminar, uh, and um, he then came back, and I was in it again. And then I ended up, the school let me do an independent project with him when he left the university, and, and we became quite close. And, uh, and he was really sort of the person who, the first professional who really said, you know the work you're doing is is uh, you, you should take it very seriously and um, and pursue it and give it your life. You know, and he was very uh, disappointed when I got a job on in the investment field gotcha. and was very clear about that. And so it was very uh, that was a case where when Rules of Civility came out, you know, we, we had the chance to he we had the chance to, yeah. to close that circle, and, and you know, both to his satisfaction and mine, you know. And, uh, and we were always very close, but it was very nice to, before he died, to have, to have actually, to have actually <laughs> delivered after all those years. <laughs> oh my God, you know, it would have been a nightmare if I, had, if, 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 he had, you know, if I had failed to do so. So how was Matheson as, a, as an instructor, I guess? Oh, I, I, I love Was he the first real professional writer you had known? Uh, or he, he and, uh, well, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, well... I know nothing about your upbringing and yeah. whether you were raised around, you know, an artistic. I, I'm, a, or I'm a suburban Boston wasp, you know, okay. by up, upbringing, and, uh, and and I, I think that for me, uh, you know, as I said, I, I, I really had the desire and the ambition to be a, a serious writer, a, a, to be a writer of serious narrative, as a very young person, you know, uh, certainly younger than 16, and and. Um, and kind of as I was, as you're writing as a teenager, uh, you're kind of along the way, I, I, w I would feel that you'd read something, you'd write something, I'd read what I'd written, I'd read what somebody else had written, and, and I, you, you kind of have this 
it, to some degree, it's arrogance, but, you know, saying, you know, I, I can do this. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's also sort of a, a self-revelation. I, I know how to do this. And, um, and you read a book and say, I can do better than that, you yeah. know, or you read something else and you're like, oh, I, 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 I can, I'm so close. Yeah. You know, that's a hero of mine. I can almost do what that person is doing. So you're kind of having the, these feelings and it's very private. You know, you're not, it's not a public process as you're kind of going through that as a young person. It's very private. And, um, and occasionally, you know, you end up in a writing class and as a high school or whatever, and something is on the table and, and someone in the room is like, this is great, you know, and people are like, this is terrible, or I don't understand this, or what are you doing? You know, you get both, right? Yeah. But the person you respect, let's say, says, no, this is, this is great. And so that, that helps you along. And I, and I have always said, you know, you don't need, I think for a young artist, you don't need a chorus of support. You need one person. And if you have one person you admire who gives you encouragement of a serious kind, that can carry you for at least, I don't know, five years, ten years, you know, as you go back into solitude and, and, and you know, a, a lack of, of, of any external support. You're, you know, I did not, it wasn't like my family, my family didn't really pay attention to my writing. They kind of knew I was doing it, but they didn't, they weren't really the people who were like, we love this and you should do it and all the power to you. You know, and of course, when I came out of college, they were like, get a job. <laughs> you know, I guess art, the art, my father just who, who, who loved me and, and was just worried that, you know, if you chose the path of a writer, you'd end up, you know, for him, Hemingway was his hero. So he thought every, every writer was going to end up drunk and shooting themselves with a shotgun, <laughs> you know. So he's like, well, don't do that. So, so um, but, uh, but, you know, in the end, he was very excited. Yeah. He was very excited that, that I ended up doing it. But. But um, so it is. So it's kind of a little very lonely that process. And, and there's something nice about that. It should be lonely. I like the fact it's lonely. You take power from that energy, from the fact that it's lonely, it's and from the fact that it's private. But then, um, yes, when I got to Yale, uh, the first thing was when I was a sophomore, I applied to a seminar from a visiting writer named Walter Abish, hmm. who lived uh, here in the East Village and uh, was a ex very experimental novelist, um, but uh, you know a great uh, writer and thinker generally. And, um, and that was kind of round. I got into the seminar. He was very intrigued by my writing and that was sort of the first one. And, and then, and as I say, when I got into Peter's and I kind of, after I think I had submitted three stories, um, after the third, you know, uh, he said, you know, can I speak to you at the end of class or whatever? And, and he said, listen, you know, you, uh, I don't know who you are. I don't know what you you know, what you want, what your ambitions are, um, you know, what, what's, what's interesting or what drives you. But, you know, I think you have serious talent and I think that, you know, you, and I, you should take it very seriously. And, you know, I would hope that, that you continue to pursue it and et cetera. And so that was kind of the beginning of a relationship. And then, as I said, then I went, he came back and I went to another seminar and then he left and I did the independent project with him. And, um, and continue to work with him before going to Stanford. And, and that was certainly the, you know, aside from, from Abish's, you know, work, the, 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 the connection with Peter was, was the most important for me. And that's partly because we were very, we got along, you know, we had a similar sense of humor. We had, you know, we could talk at, you know, not about anything for like an hour yeah. at a time. And, and so, it didn't uh, have to be the heavy, we're going to discuss the meaning of art sort yeah, of conversation. Yeah, no, Good, no, no. Was, you know, we had a lot of hilarity, and, and it was we just got along. And, and so, and, and I, you know, I read Far, Far Tortuga before he came to Yale. I was going to ask, had you read his work before? I had read, but, you know, and that was the one that really grabbed me. And, and so then when he came, I was like, oh, I, you know, oh, my God, this is the guy who wrote that book I love so much. And and so, um, so you know, so all those things came together. And he was kind of a New England wasp, too, you know, so maybe you get that, you know. And, and, uh, and you, you know, there's obviously all this father figure stuff and... That's a part of that. And, um, but, uh, but anyway, so we, we, so yes, that became extremely important and, 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 and it's why I, it's probably one of the main reasons why I did, you know, ultimately get the focus and the, the endurance to write the fiction while I still had the job. Mm -hmm. As I said, it's because yeah, I didn't want to disappoint him. Yeah. You know, and I didn't want to disappoint. I didn't want to fall short of what he thought I could do. Yeah, had, had you guys stayed in touch when you were? We had in stayed in touch. World? Yeah, okay. and of course, he was quite cool to me after I, you know, I, you know, in yeah. the interim while I was, he was waiting for me to return, I would say, "I'm going to do it," and he'd say, "Uh huh." Yeah. You know, and, yeah, I've seen that before. And he did. He said that. He said, "I've seen a lot of people like you, you know, go to Wall Street and never come back." Hmm. He's like, you know, and I think you should assume that's what's going to happen to you. And so anyway, yeah, it was, it's all you know. That's the that's the personal psychological part of it. Yeah, that's what I like. So. <laughs> 
Uh, besides him, though, literary influences when you were developing in those those years, I guess. You mean the people I didn't know? You mean that? Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. The, the I hadn't people. met. <laughs> you know, I, I, I I'm 55, and so I and I didn't. You know, rules of civility was you know in my 40s. Comes out in my 40s or whatever. So, but you know, by the time I sat down to write that book, I had my list of influences was very long, mm -hmm. you know, because over the course of, you know, at that point, almost 30 years, sure. you know, I would find something and dig into it and delve into it and copy it and, you know, or whatever, and, and then move on. And, and so, you know, in the course of my life, uh, I have spent a great deal of time and, uh, you know, reading with great care and with great admiration, um, Faulkner, Conrad, uh, Wharton and James. Um, I, you know, I loved the magical realists out of Latin America. You know, most not surprisingly, you know, Marquez at the top of the pack for me. Um, I love the uh, the American Renaissance figures, uh, Whitman and Emerson and Dickinson and Thoreau and uh, Melville. Um, I wrote my senior essay on Moby Dick. Um, what was the title? Oh, Jesus, I don't even know. Oh, what it was, was the, terrible. What was, was the terrible. subject, I guess? I remember it was a terrible title, I'm okay. sure. As long as it wasn't the whiteness, you know. That, no, it wasn't, no. It was, it was, it was, I was very interested in poetics. So it was all about yeah. the use of, of metonymy and synecdoche in the course mm -hmm. of the book and how it relates to nature and industrialism in the age. And it was very, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but then, you know, I, I, love, uh, um, I love the experimental French writers. I love the, Europe, you know, the Russians, of course, I've read a great deal. Uh, you know, I was a great fan of Milan Kundera and some of the people that came out of the late Soviet Eastern yeah. Bloc. You know, um, so, so it's, you kind of, each one of the things you'd find and I'd read and, and, and they would have an influence. So as I say, the influence, the, the field of influence is quite wide. And that's not including music, you know, sure. which, you know, probably from the age of 15 or something, Bob Dylan is probably one of my, you know, greatest influences of all. And know? I see him on a New Yorker yeah, cover yeah, on yeah, your right, refrigerator. Yeah, on my yeah. refrigerator. It's on our hall. Yeah, upstairs in the hallway, too. Um, I did record with Milton Glaser a few weeks ago. The oh, yeah, yeah. The yes, psychedelic of villain from, yeah, uh, absolutely. Yeah. From self-portrait, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, man. And that was a great conversation, too. But yeah. that's the fun of doing this yeah. in addition to having a full-time job. Yeah. I guess the question is, <laughs> without, you know, trashing anybody, whose influences did you have to expunge? What did you see pushing you in a, a wrong direction? Uh or maybe not expunge, but at least, you know, recognize that eh, that's not the sort of writer I want to be in terms of, of the writing. I, well, I guess for me, the dividing line, and maybe this is, this isn't fair or based on, on a, uh, it's, it's, it's not about their quality, but just yeah, about who you want to be as a writer. Yeah, well, yeah. The, the, the dividing line for me is really one of, uh, living or dead, you know, I, so, you know, I don't, I don't. I really avoid, in a way, I don't delve too deeply into uh, the living group of writers and for a variety of reasons. The most important one, and I say this is not very fair, and I'm a living writer, right? So, I mean, you'd think I'd be more supportive of my own <laughs> class, but, but I'm not. I'm terrible about it. And I, I, really what I'm, I find is that um, the time is, is, you know, history, however you want to put it, history is, is not very good at capturing all of quality that is made in art, yes. right? So, so there are great symphonies that have been lost and great painters that have died in poverty and the paint, they burn their own paintings, you know, like in La Boheme, and there's great writers who died in obscurity and, and, you know, and their books have never been put in print. That is a fact, you know, or they were briefly in print and then disappeared or what have you. History is not very good at capturing all that is of quality in art. However, history is very good at filtering out all that is mediocre in mm -hmm. art that has had a moment in time. And so, you know, you, if you wait a few decades, you know, and it, maybe it's 50 years or something like that, you have, but, you know, what survives that 50-year filter is tends to be pretty good, you yeah. know, and, and 100 years, it tends to be great, you know. One of the Ask Me Anything questions I got was, mm -hmm. let's say you spent 10 years on a novel, Gil, would you rather it was a critical success or a commercial success? Mm -hmm. You can't have both. And I said, I'll take commercial because the critics, who yeah. knows, 10 years from, from then it might change into something yeah. else. And the money would be nice now. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, because also the commercial success, commercial success doesn't necessarily add up into, to, to a book sustaining. It's, neither is really a very good indication of what right. survives. And, you know, as, 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 you know, as you know, 
both Moby Dick and The Great Gatsby were out of print in the lifetimes of those authors. Yeah. Now, now Moby Dick never made a dime for Melville, really, and Gatsby made uh, Fitzgerald rich. But both were out of print by the time they died, and, and so uh, you know, and those would be viewed as you know, probably two of the of the greatest canonical American works. Can, yeah, that's we're, a better way to put it. We're okay with calling yeah, things canonical, yeah, and I think that's us. the right that's the way way to put it. And, yeah. and but so as I say, I, I don't. I, I as a younger person, I was reading a lot of contemporary fiction, and uh, and I was I was drifting through it and filtering through it and, and moving from book to book and. Without really being satisfied, and or, or, or put it this way, I would have to read seven things to find something that I really liked or admired, yeah. and and uh, and so I was finally it was, it was I found it exhausting, and so I said, all right, you know, I gotta, I'm really gonna try to focus on reading books that I know for a fact would merit being read every 20 years of my life, you yeah. know, and so I started moving my cat my my target backwards in time, sure. you know, and I'm not talking about the 18th century, but you know. But I, I tend to read books by authors who are dead. What do you return to the most? Um, well, you know, I, I, like I say, I, I would anything that I've taken seriously, I would return to. I mean, I, we, you know, I, I, as you, as we talked about earlier, I read with three friends of mine, and the four of us have been reading together f uh, for sixteen years. We tend to read, uh, oh, and, and this. Who Fo decides? Yeah. This focus on reading dead authors, as you know, to put, to put it that way, it kind of began and I, uh, with them. Mm -hmm. Meaning, I decided I was going to do this. I shared that with a friend of mine, and she was like, "I want to, I want to join. Well, I'm going to join you. What are you going to do? How is it going to work? Where are you going to start?" And so we kind of recruited the other two, and the four of us have been, we've been reading together ever since. And, and and so, but we work in projects. So we had a year where we read the Russians, you know, and we uh, uh, we. Read, uh, I mean, one of our, my, and some of the times it's, we read uh, seven novels of Philip Roth one year. Uh, Although he was still alive at the time. He was but, still alive, but, but, okay. yeah, but, you know, and that was a rarity for us. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but we, we often do kind of thematic things. So one of my favorites is that we read um, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, uh, Henry James's Portrait of a Lady, uh, Flaubert's Madame Bovary, and George Eliot's Middlemarch. And we called it, 19th century wives under pressure, you know, because <laughs> that's what's really all four of those books are. And in fact, they're written like in a 50 year time frame. But, you know, Tolstoy writing in Russia and uh, Flaubert writing in France, uh, you know, James, an American writing in England about a, an American ending up in Italy and uh, and, you know, Eliot writing about England. And, and uh, so you really have four different landscapes by four different, uh, you know, uh, four writers of great quality of four different nationalities, but the, the thematic overlap between those four yeah. books is amazing and fascinating in terms of the, uh, the rising influence of the middle class, you know, the bourgeoisie, the, the, uh, the, the secularity of the, you know, the growing, the fading of the church or uh, the role of women in society, you know, the role of marriage in society, you know, all these things are, are the country versus city dynamics are all very much a part of all four of those books, but in four different landscapes. And um, so anyway, so as I say, we'll do these kinds of things. Well, I, any one of those books, I would absolutely pick up and read again 10 and 20 years from now. You know, and that's the nature of it. I, I don't, um, and, you know, we had so much fun rereading Dostoevsky. You know, I, there's no question. We'd all read Dostoevsky in our 19, 20 year old, and mm -hmm. we all found his writing to be so much more uh, thrilling and funny and enjoyable, uh, you know, as an adult. Uh, you know, we read, a, we did a project where we read, Emerson Dickinson, uh, Thoreau, uh, as a uh, did Emerson and, make and any Whitman. more sense now than, than yes, we were, okay, yeah, good, it was good. great, That's and we great. so we did that, but then we did that as a way of then reading. We read five novels of Twain, and then six novels of Faulkner. It was kind of this a year of the American sort of the evolution of the American voice, and um, and you know Twain was an amazing, fun, great experience for us, and. You know, again, like Huck Finn or Tom Sawyer or The Great Gatsby, which we've read together, is those are wasted on on sixteen year old kids. I mean, in a way, it's a crime that they keep requiring sixteen year olds to read these books that you know that that every high school class has read for a hundred years. You know, and and and, and, and Shakespeare also kids get alienated well, that, on that, Shakespeare. Yeah, well, that's true. But you know, at least they, I mean, that's that's an introduction of a different kind. But 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 at any rate, the, you know, these books are are much more interesting at the age of forty for certain. And, and so um, so yes, I, they're, 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 we I like to go back to do those things. Sure. Could you have written either of those books, either of your published books, when you were? Under forty, you know, I, I, 
I, did, did you feel like you had the experience, not the writing experience, but the world experience? I think I could have come close. I yeah. don't, I don't put too much stead in, in, you know, I, to put it in really simple terms mm -hmm. for me, you know, the, the Beatles, you know, they formed at the age of like 18. Oh yeah. You and know? you look at an eight year stretch and, and, and nobody's they, going to be that. And they, they broke off. They, they yeah. were broken up by the time they were 30 or roughly, you know, something like that. Or at 64, to, but they were probably were younger than 30. And, and, but you, but more to the point, you know, same thing with the early age of the who or whatever. If you look at, at the, the topics that they're dealing with and this, the nuance and sophistication with which they address those topics, um, they are very much ageless. You know, they're not, they don't, they don't, it doesn't read like, I mean, their music is, the, the, the thematic content of their music does not in any way seem adolescent or post-adolescent. It doesn't feel like a 24-year-old no, did this. No, no, yeah, absolutely yeah. not. And, and this is true, you know, Fitzgerald's, you know, writing quite young, right? Uh, again, you know, he was done, again, in his, he was, he was burned out and on his way out by the time he, you know, I mean, 40, my God, you know, I can't remember if he even saw 40. But, but you know, uh, you know, he, he was writing great, and Hemingway, too, they were writing great uh, work at, the, at a young age. I go back and read some of my short fiction, uh, you know, uh, from when I was 17, 18, 19, and, and my biggest response is, is I'm surprised by it, uh, by how intricate it is or how, you know, nuanced it might be. Um, yeah, that wouldn't be true if I was reading something from the time I was 14. Yeah, yeah. But there's something about that moment in life of 19, 20, 18, you know, where you're so many things are running through your mind and through your emotions. And, and it's quite a sophisticated time because you're questioning everything and, you know, and you're questioning yourself and you're finding yourself. And that's a very powerful foundation from which to be examining human life, whether that's in song or in painting or in, in the novel. And, and so, you know, I, I don't, I don't feel that, um, that these that these that the, these books would have been out of my reach necessarily in my early twenties. More that probably in my the biggest advantage to me about being in middle age, writing those books and having already had a profession, and you know, uh, is that I really had the freedom to write those books for myself. I didn't, you know, as a younger person, the, the, your your biggest challenges are things like you're you know trying to. You are faced with the desire to impress your friend, your peers, mm -hmm. to impress your parents, you know, to or to piss off your parents, or to piss off your parents, yeah. you know, to to make money, you know, in the, you know, or, or you know, uh, to um, to create an identity for yourself, you know, which are not the best influences on artistic decision making, if you want to put it that way. But but so to be, you know, one of the great things for me about being forty five, having had a career, I had a wife, I had children, I had a house, you know, whatever, all that stuff, is is that when I sat down to write Rules of Civility, I really wrote it for myself. I didn't, you know, yeah. I wasn't writing it for anybody other than myself. And and that is a certain amount of artistic liberty. And I think at the age of nineteen twenty, even though I had the the the, the talent, the raw talent to be able to achieve much of what's in that book, I might have I would not have had the peace for me, I would not have had the presence of mind yeah. to do as good of a job. Your kids read your work yet? That's just beginning. Uh, yeah. yeah. They're still youngish. I, yeah. I so, they're both teenagers. That's, I just was wondering whether it's a, uh, you know, I don't know. Dad just writes stuff. Yeah, I think know? that's more like what it is still. <laughs> um, in keeping with the Matheson thing, we can bring up the Paris Review writers at work sort of thing. Um, writing practice for yep. you? Is there a, a time of day, schedule, routine? I tend to be... Um, I tend to be, I try to be at my desk writing by nine, mm -hmm. you know, uh, something like that. And, um, you know, get up, have my coffee, flip to the newspaper, do a crossword, whatever. And then, but at my desk by nine and I tend to at my desk till noon. And then I will carry my work to lunch and I'll have lunch alone out of the house and, uh, and will work, you know, either edit what I was written, wrote in the morning or bring my notebooks and start writing, uh, material for the next day. So kind of from 9 to one thirty, it's uninterrupted, you know, solo work. The afternoon is a little bit more mixed, um, and then the evenings are more mixed. You know, there are times when I'm working in the afternoon or the evening and times when I'm not, you know. Um, but the morning I try to protect it at all costs. Okay. Uh, writing primarily on computer, or do you do longhand? I do both. I do yeah. both. But I, I don't, I don't but... if you looked at a chapter of mine, it, it's, it's the product of all of the above. So meaning it's, you know, I will have written portions of that chapter by hand, long hand in a notebook, and then I've typed that in and changed it, and then we'll then build on that by writing at the computer. And so I, I do 
I do. I work in all those forms. Listen to music while you're writing. I do listen to music while with I'm words writing. or without. I can do both. Really? Yeah. I, okay. I find it impossible with any sort of work to, to have vocals. I can do on. vocals. I can't do it very loud. And, and but I you know and very often it's mood based. I will use music maybe to to target a particular mood, or I'll get you know there'll be something that I I, I don't really know where it comes from. I, you know, I'm, in the work I'm working on right now. I'm listening to the Fleet Foxes over and over and over. <laughs> I'm listening to Jose Gonzalez over and over nice. and over. When I find something that, that's working for me kind of mood-wise, I will play it, you know, every day for and three months. And you've got that, that 15-minute song, Cycling Trivialities. You can just yeah, put yeah, that right. on. Yeah, and just, I just go keep playing go, forever, you know, go. And it's so, <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I, I have certain things like that that, uh, that I'll latch on to. And, you know, uh, and they're not... It's not like I go and listen to Russian music when I wrote Gentleman in Moscow or 30s music when I wrote yeah. uh, Rules of Civility by any means. I think, you know, when I wrote Rules of Civility, I think it was listening to uh, uh, Bavarian Fruit Bread. Is that what it is? By Hope, you know, Hope Sandoval <laughs> over and over and over. You know, but. Yeah. Um, we talk about dead authors, uh, aversion to contemporary fiction. Both novels have been set in the past. And again, it's not a version. No, not a version. I, I don't want to speak badly because you know, I, I, and, I, and, I, and I've read much more we'll say avoidance. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, much more. I've read much more contemporary fiction since becoming a novelist. Partly because you know you're you want to see what's out there. Yeah, and well, it's also because I meet the people, and, and I, you know, I, I've had the very you know great fortune of. Uh, you know, when I was writing you know, more contemporary fiction, I did admire uh, greatly uh, uh, Jennifer Egan's, uh, you know, Goon Squad, and 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 I got asked, would you interview her? Of course, I got asked for the, you know, I wrote the review for her last novel for the New York Times, and and then you know I had a chance to interview her in person, and, you know, so you know that I, I've interviewed Richard Russo in person, I've, uh, I've come to know Ann Patchett, uh, and, and who I and, and these are all people where I love, you know, their work. I think Ann, Pat, Ann is an, is a great great novelist and Richard is, is a great novelist and um, you know uh, Elizabeth Strout I, I had a chance to interview her and again you know she writes beautifully and, and so um, and, and you know I think it helps now that that also we as a group are you know range now in age between you know 55 and 80 you know yeah. so, so it's also you know we've now had you know 30 years of, of to evaluate Richard Russo you know and I, right. <laughs> so it's also not filtering through what's on the you know what's fresh and hot off the press. You know, these are people where there's a real serious body work behind them. And, uh, and, and as I say, so I, I have a lot of them and, and I could list many, many more oh, sure. uh, contemporary writers who I ad admire. Um, but yes, I, in terms of managing time, right. I tilt towards the classics because I just don't have that much time to read, uh, you know, as I'd like. Would you set a novel contemporary? Um, Only because the first two have been in, I don't want to say historical novels, but they're in the past. Yes, yeah, because I don't think of myself as a, as a writer of historical novels. Yeah. I, um, I, I'm well, Gentleman in Moscow is closer because it yeah. ends in the fifties. My new book I'm working on is set in 1954, so that's closer. Um, and, and actually, I, I, I will have a uh, a short story coming out uh, this September, which is actually published by the Amazon. Guy. Okay. It'll be yeah. it'll be Kindle only, I guess, is the mm -hmm. way you know, it's an ebook. But it's what it's actually a short story in an anthology. What happened is that uh, Blake Crouch, uh, the uh, best selling writer of who writes sort of science fiction, um, but you know, science fiction is too narrow a term for what he does. His his book right now, which is a bestseller recursion, is you know, is a combination of sort of sci fi and noir and uh, suspense and horror. I mean, not kind of all together, um, but it's very much in the future. Um, and, and uh, but Blake and I had met uh, once, and uh, he had gone on to read *A Gentleman in Moscow* and, and enjoyed it. And uh, Amazon approached him and said, "Would you edit and contribute to an anthology of uh, of six an anthology of six science fiction short stories?" Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so he went about, he said yes. And so he went out and he got Andy Weir, who wrote The Martian, gotcha. and, yeah. uh, you know, a number of high, he got, you know, a number of high profile sci fi writers to contribute in this, you know, out of, uh, 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 Paul Tremblay, who wrote The Cabin at the End of the World, is one of the contributors. But so sort of having built this team of five, um, of which he's one, he, he called me and said, listen, this is sort of crazy and out of the blue, but this is what we're doing, and would you be number six, you know, and, and uh, I was I was thrilled. I thought it was great, you know. And I, I um I probably the first writer who I read systematically 
um, as, a, as a young teenager was Ray Bradbury, okay. you know, and, uh, you know, I started with the illustrated man and, uh, and then, you know, my mother gave me his hardcover collection of short stories and I read the entire thing from beginning to end, which is, you know, like, a, I don't know, make some crazy thing, like a hundred stories or 80 stories or something. Um, when we were young though, yeah, we could do that. Yes, we yeah. could. Right. You stop, yeah. you know, you don't get up from, you just sit down and keep going. And, and so, um, so when he reached out, I said, yeah, I'd love it. So now that, you know, that story is set. And I, not as a, it was not surprising to Blake uh, that that my story ended up being set like five minutes in the future. <laughs> yeah. So you know, which is kind of the space that is more likely for me to be operating. But, but it's great because the collection, which is called Forward and comes out, I think September seventeen, is this um, is it, it spans you know a hundred years in the future to as I say five minutes in the future and uh, you know some some on Earth, some elsewhere. Um, but uh, so, so you know that was that was fun, and I, I've written a number of. Of short stories, uh, Audible is is releasing a short story of mine in November, which is part, part of the reason that my short stories ended up in Amazon or Audible is because I tend to write quite long short stories. My short mm-hmm. stories tend to be fifteen to twenty thousand words, and the you know the normal uh, outlets for literary fiction in America tend to prefer more like four thousand words right. or five thousand words. Um, so, but I have a long short story coming out in Audible, which is very much set in the present in New York and. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I uh, expect to have a collection of short stories, a whole collection of them that will come out in the next five years, which a lot of them are set in New York between, you know, 1980 and the present or whatever. So I, I don't mind, you know, working in the in the current sphere, um, you know. Is a short story writing process, how different is that for you for the novel writing? Obviously, you're not going to do as extensive an outlining. Yeah. Or maybe you are. No, I, well, I, you you're right. My outline looked much, I do outline, but it's much shorter. Yeah. Um, you know, it tends to have like 10 bullet points, you know, that are fleshed out in detail or 10, you know, something like that. But, mm-hmm. uh, yeah, but it is, um, it is different. Uh, and I don't, you know, I, I don't know, um, uh, my, 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 my readers who really like John Moscow and like Will Smith may read the short stories and be like, Ugh, huh? you know, yeah, right. <laughs> terrible. You know, it doesn't include any of the things that I like about him. I don't know, you know, um, but it's, I, I have a short story that came out in Granta, uh, this week. Uh, and, uh, you know, and it's been interesting to see readers of me discover that and then come back and reach out and, and have comments about that. Well, that's been the, the recurring theme. And it started for me with David Gates many, many years ago when I was doing this. I'd known David for a bunch of years, but you know, he, he was the first writer to clue me in onto the dude, when it comes to an audience, you're damned if you do, you're damned if you don't. Yeah, right, Either well, yeah. he just does the same thing again and again, right. or why won't he do the same thing that I like again yeah, and right. again? No, so, sure. yeah. yeah, you know, yes. it's, it's more power to you if you're just, yeah. you know. Uh, you know, it, it is, you know, this, uh, the, of course, you know, if, if, you're, if you're a lover of novels in, in particular and you read my books and you're, you really like my books, a short story is not going to give you some of the things that make that book so satisfying to you because yeah. you're not going to have the evolution of a character over 30 years. You're not mm-hmm. going to have, you know, events on page 30 that recur on page 270 in this right. great reverberating <laughs> way. It doesn't feel the same in a 15 page story, you know. So, so by definition, it's a different experience. And, and but, you know, there's some people who love that, that the difference of that. And, you know, what, what I, I hope is that the. The readers who are in the, the short stories of, it was, of course, how I trained. It's the way most novelists train, and um, it's a great also place to get a window on how I develop a voice, how I develop a sense of place, how I develop a sense of time. You know, how I develop a character, a characterization. You know, because it, that's what's happening in that short form. You know, those things are there, and, and uh, so if nothing else, you know, that's what it is. It's a glimpse of of that being being explored and trying to have it crystallize and and yes there's a beginning middle and end you know you know that you that you either like or don't like you know and it has resonance or it doesn't have resonance um uh but so it, it is different i what i tend to do i I've re- i wrote a lot of the short stories that will end up in the collection i wrote a lot of them while i was on the road mm-hmm. for a gentleman in moscow and uh and some while i was on the road for rules of civility uh, in in both cases i had the good fortune um, to have an opportunity to speak about the books uh, across the country. Uh, you know, if you have a book and it is not well received, you're not invited to go anywhere. And if you are invited, you shouldn't go. You know, that's just, <laughs> I mean, you know, that's just the reality. And, uh, you know, you just, you should go back and write your next book. And, and, and I say that it's advice to me too, you know, mm-hmm. and, uh, but if you have a book that's being received, then, then it's kind of the opposite is true, which is that, 
that even though there's a desire to go back and sit in your office and get to work on the next book, there is a great uh, argument to be made that when you're given the liberty of somebody being interested in the book, you should get, you know, even it means leaving your house and, you know, and it, it's a, my family pays a price for that. You know, I pay a price for that. Um, and my art pays a price for that. But uh, I think it's very important, you know, uh, to to go out and to have a chance to speak to audiences, to talk to them about what you're doing, how you approach your work. And, and, and it's a luxury because it's a chance to to establish a closer relationship with a reader. Right. And so. So I did do a lot of that for both books. You know, I was on the road for a year for both books, at least. And um, and during that time, I, I can't start a new novel. So, the, but that is a period of time where I can work on shorter fiction. You know, for all not, the reasons that you could anticipate. And not able to outline while traveling. And, and I, I only well, ask outline. Because, I do that. I do that. But you know, and, yeah. I, and I am I am planning the next book while I'm doing right. that. No question about it. That's easy. But in terms of actually sitting down and sure. beginning to write chapters, it's it's too distracting. Well, this is. Both day jobs that I've had over the the last twenty years, uh, business travel is a significant part of it. Which yeah. um, I've done, yeah, yeah. And I figured best practices when not every hotel is the Metropole yeah. or that that one in Geneva that that inspired a gentleman in Moscow. Yeah. Any um, <laughs> <laughs> any tips? <laughs> my my one has always been just assume that everything in the hotel has been everything in your room has been used yeah, well, for a horrible okay, purpose yeah, by a lonely okay, traveler okay. at some point. So I'm trying not to think about those yeah, things. The remote control, the things. coffee machine. Don't don't do it. You know, it's it's very much it's yeah. and again if you if you have the luxury of speaking, you know, in in uh, it's it's not a glamorous no. life. You know, uh, courtyard. Marriotts or well, or, and I, it's also yeah. it's it's what I mean by it is that you know you are in um, you know you, you might do uh, ten cities in twelve days, yeah. you know, and, and so uh, you you know it really is a dynamic of you you get up early, you go to the airport, you fly to where you're going, you arrive, you get to the hotel, you know, let's say uh, you know at two or something like that, having eaten in an airport and. Um, Two, three, you check in and you've got, you know, three hours before you need to be at the venue. And, you know, you're just trying to, you just want to cool down just for a second. stare at a wall yeah, for a while. Yeah, you know, and then yeah. you do that. And uh, and then you, you know, you got to be at the venue at six or whatever. And then you you, you speak at seven. You, I, I don't want to eat or drink before I speak. So, you know, uh, so you're there. You speak speak to seven to eight. You sign books till nine. Um, and then you go back and you're at the hotel alone and eating dinner at, you know, and having a drink at 930. Yeah. And then you go to bed and get up at dawn and do it again, you know. And so you've in, in total, you, you only had a chance to see that town for two or three hours in the middle if you took advantage of yeah. that. Or from the window with a car. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. You know, so it's, it's not that's what I mean by it's not very glamorous. It, it is it is very much work. And I, it's like the life of a stand up comic in that sense. And you got to get up and say the same thing. And um and again, it's it's something I don't I'm not complaining about because you're lucky to have the chance to do it. But it is quite grueling. And um, uh, you know, in the, what I did rules of civility, that that three hour window in the hotel, the two to five or whatever it is, three to six, um, as you went from city to city to city, uh, town to town to town, uh, I you know when I when I started general when, I, when a general Moscow was about to go on tour, I was like, you know what, I am I am. I am not going to do that. So I, I launched an Instagram account solely with the intent that I would post a pit photograph from everywhere I went. So <laughs> I would you. land, I would go to the hotel, I would dump my bags, have half a sandwich or whatever, and then I would just walk and I'd leave. And mm -hmm. I'd go spend two hours and I'd roam the city until I'd taken a picture and posted it and then I could go home and rest, you know, for an hour before I spoke. But, you know, so then I, I got a little bit more of a glimpse. But as I say, it's, it, that's really what it is. You know, it is... Um, it is kind of a grueling, uh, you know, rolling, you know, job. Did your previous careers travel itinerary sort of prepare you for this? Yes. Okay. I did a lot of. I did a lot. I did a lot of that in yeah. my prior career. So, so I'm kind of. I'm, I'm not. I'm it's not. not, totally I'm not new, I do but not you're also mind, an older person. Yeah. Doing I'm it. quite easy. You know, easy around airports and in taxi yeah. cabs. And, you know. But it's still when you're doing that at 30. Yeah. It's very different than no, doing it true. for me at 48. That's it's true. still the holy crap. This is the third city I've been in in five days. Yeah, yes. What is my hotel room number? Yeah. Again? Yeah. Yeah. No. No. It's true. Yeah. It's true. So it does kind of kind of wallop you over time. But I will, um, I will say this too, yeah. having had the luxury of of meeting a number of, of writers that I respect, you know, in the last five years. Across the country, I find that so many of you know the of the top of the field uh, will do this work, you know, and, and you know there's a handful who, who don't. The, the, the guys who 
who it's hardest, who can't do it really, are the the people who are publishing a book every year. You know, I know Harlan Coben, I know Lee Child. You know, they 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 don't don't need to do it. They don't want to do it. You know, as much, but they can't do it. You right. know what I mean? Because they're publishing a book every year. Yeah. yeah, but you know, the you look at the novels who are writing serious literary fiction, and uh, and they're they're popping up around the country. You know, and and uh, and. Um, and, and they're putting in that time and effort too, and, and going through the cycles of they'll have a book where people show, and then they'll have a book where fewer people show, and you know, yeah. and but they they still you know are still at it, and uh, so I have, I have I have great respect for that, you know that that professionalism that they uh, show in relationship to their readers and to the independent bookstores, because that's another factor. It's one of the reasons that they do do it, and one of the reasons I do it is because uh, it is a chance to go out and to be in those stores, to repay those stores, you know, a kindness in essence, and uh, to shake hands with the booksellers who work there, um, to be there for their local audience, you know. Um, and, and, but, you know, and that's, you know, uh, that's a part of that ethos for that group. Mm-hmm. It's, I figure we should balance it out with the Amazon mentions before. It's always good to, to yes. make sure we understand that the no. bookstores are critical to... Yeah. to yeah, and it's a, it's nice to write a short story for Amazon, and 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 Amazon obviously has been a big success as a, as a business. But there's no question about it that it's the independent bookstores in America that make taste. Yeah. Amazon doesn't. Amazon delivers books mm-hmm. at a low cost, but they don't help you discover books. Yeah, and they so can the say that, of, you know, the lack of serendipity is the thing yeah, that kills me about the yeah, whole algorithm yeah, world that we're yeah. we're part of. Yes, and so so any yeah. any serious literary fiction that has been discovered in the course of the last twenty years, it was discovered by the independent bookstores. And brought to the readers through that mechanism. Now, ultimately, Amazon sells a lot of that book once that happens. Mm-hmm. But it's really uh, without the independent bookstores, the the opportunity for authors to be discovered in the country would suffer dramatically. Favorite New York bookstore historically? Well, you know, I, I don't. I, I, I am. We have the luxury of being both in a town with a lot of bookstores and in an era where bookstores are, are beginning to grow again. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, I love uh, both the stores and know the people uh, at, uh, at you know Green Light, like Rebecca Fitting and Jessica, uh, and, and I, you know, at you know, McNally Jackson, you know, uh, uh, the Three Lives, Shakespeare and Company. Uh, books are magic. You know, I, yeah. I am. I know them all, and I'm in all those stores. So you're, you're, you're store promiscuous. That's good. Yeah, I, I like you know, that. I, because we have, they're all different. And they all the people are different, um, and but we have the luxury of being in a town where all those things exist. Now, I also actually frequent Bar- Barnes and Noble, which is around the corner, yeah. and the Strand too. It's but, just a few blocks away. Yeah, and the away, Strand, right? I'm Biggie yeah. Strand. You know, and, and, and Barnes and Noble, I now refer to as the largest independent bookstore in America. You yeah. know, because I mean, <laughs> you know, it was back. There was a day when they were you know, they were viewed as the enemy, but they're far yeah. from the enemy anymore. You know, yeah. they're they're lucky to be alive. You know, so the are desperate to keep them. Yes, you know, yes, afloat. they're fighting too, and mm-hmm. they do a good job. You know, I, I mean, they they create an environment where there's a lot of books uh, in house, and there's a lot of books on display, mm-hmm. and and they are there are there is a knowledgeable desk, uh, particularly you know here in the city, you know at Barnes and Noble, if you went to the the, the desk, the people who are there every day, yeah. they have a very sophisticated view of what's in print right now. You know, um, so yeah, I mean, all of them are, are great. Yeah. Favorite New York? You mentioned the short stories also are. Yep. are Essentially contemporary New York, yeah, but yeah. favorite era for the city, favorite oh, neighborhood for the city. For you know you? what? I I don't. I I think I love all the eras of yeah. New York. I mean, I I think they're they're. All, you know, one of the one of the things I think is funny about New York is is um, that you you know there's this there's this thing about you know oh my God you know that that's closed and you know now that's become gentrified and and this is you know fury that gets repeated every decade that you know yeah. oh, where, where's my East Village you know and the city's not the same anymore but but and I kind of went through that too to some degree um, that feeling having you know moved here and lived on East Third Street and then lived on the Bowery for 15 years and seeing that change unfold but um, having arrived in the late 80s when you know crack was here and you know where'd it go you know <laughs> like, like like we want that back you know but but, but we, we, act, people, we act like it that we want it back yeah. you know but but uh, but it is. Um, in retrospect, or upon reflection, one of the things that interests me about that is that the New York that that I came looking for, that 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 the, the New York that attracted me, that I wanted to be a part of, was the New York in 1930s and film yeah. and fiction. You know, I mean, it's, so so you know, when I arrived here in the 80s, it wasn't here. Right. You know, but that I didn't bother me. You know, I you know the fact that you know Fred Astaire is not dancing in New York anymore, you know, and, and Dorothy you know, Parker at the Algonquin. Yeah, yeah, they're not yeah. here, and Bogart's not a hoodlum on the east side, you know, I mean, you know, so what? But, you know, that's the funny thing about it. I think that, that we, we are drawn to New York 
often by a New York that's gone. Yeah. You know, and, and yet, you know, so, so like to be an- anxious about the New York that we're, that's leaving in our time is misguided because mm-hmm. what I'm convinced of without fat, without, without, what I'm convinced of without question is that 20 years from now, there's going to be young people coming to New York because they read Patty Smith's, you know, autobiography. Yeah. Yeah. And they're going to be like, I want to be there listening to her music. And they're like, you know, Oh my God, the heyday of CBGB. And you know, they're going to read that and they're going to listen to the music and the talking heads and whatever else, or the class or, you know, the sex pistols. And they're going to, that's what's the Ramones. That's what's going to bring them to New York. And it's all going to be gone, but that's okay. And they're going to find, you know, here, they're going to be thrilled to be in the place where that happened. They're going to find something very different that they're going to immediately be a part of. And 20 years later, they're going to be furious when the thing they're a part of right. is fading. <laughs> but some kid 20 years later is going to love the thing that they were a part of. And that's the way it goes. You know. <laughs> Last question, sort of. Um, Tolsiverse, you, you've got a recurring character from both both books. Yes. Is there a whole right. sense you're trying to create the Marvel Cinematic Universe except with your own, well, your own AI style? I only, <laughs> yes. And, and then my new book, there's a little bit of overlap too. I, you know, I do see that as a part of... Uh, you know, continue. my project, I, that'll, that will continue. Yeah. And as I say, the even Hollywood thing is a connection. Um, I, you know, and, and it's partly, it's for the fun of it. You yeah. know, that's, a, you know, that, that's for my, for me, for my fun, you know, a little bit for the reader's fun, a little bit for my fun. I, you know, hopefully the reader's fun. Um, I do think a lot about, um, when I was setting out to write a gentleman in Moscow, my, I thought a lot about it and my ambition, which may not have achieved, but my ambition was really for the two books to be more than the sum of their parts. Mm-hmm. So, you know, that, that as a reader went from one to the other, that it, you, you know, the universe starts to grow around them and, uh, somehow, and they, they ref, the books refer to each other and, and uh, not not simply in terms of an overlapping character, but somehow resonate and complementary. Yeah, they're complementary. I think of them as cousins. And uh, in that way, and in fact, when, when Vikings said, what do you want the cover to look like? I said, well, I want it to be a black and white period photograph because I want them to feel like cousins, even though they're totally set in different places and at different times with different issues. And, um, and, and, I, and, I, and I see that as being a continuing part of my project. I would like someone to read four of my books when they're done and sort of feel like, ah, oh, yes, it's, sort of this, it's this weird thing. You could almost put them in a box, even though they have nothing to do with each other. Well, you know, somehow, you know, and... Um, and, and so having the, the, you know, character appear in the two books was a way just for me of kind of almost as a reminder, you know, that, that these are a part of some, some, uh, universe of mine. Um, and, and I want them to be in that way, but I, you know, ultimately I want the reader to experience that, you know, and that's, I, I have read, it seems like a weird way to put it, but you know, you read certain authors where you read the third book, and it's it's they're less than the sum of their parts. Mm-hmm. You know, and obviously the, the the greatest example of that is sequels. I mean, most the vast majority of sequels uh, in film or books, uh, we feel that you know that the, the, the second they oh I wish they hadn't done the second book. You know, it kind of yeah. now it it weighs down the pleasure I felt on that first book. You know, <laughs> it is hard to take up a of a character and keep writing about that character in a way that builds. I, I spent the summer reading, I like to read suspense or mystery in the summer. And I read an author chronologically usually. And this summer I've been reading the George Smiley books of John Le Carre, oh, wow. yeah. of which there are nine. I've read six in a row chronologically. Well, my God, you know, that is, that is absolutely a more than the sum of the parts case. You know, even though, Smiley is the central figure of some and a bit character and others. As you read him, you just feel the thing getting bigger and bigger and bigger, you know, and it's a gift. Um, uh, and partly because I think he's, he's one of the finest uh, post-Second World War writers in any genre in English. You know, I don't think of him as a... Uh, I, I would never call him, you know, the great, the, be, the best suspense oh, yeah, writer. Yeah, he's not just a you know, oh espionage or yeah. thriller or something. Oh, my this God. Is he's, he's writing fiction. so, yeah, yeah, he's writing such, so much, you know, better than so many other writers in any genre that, uh, and, and with such finesse and with such thoughtfulness and, uh, and, you know, great turns of phrase and great imagery, great pace, you know, all these various uh, components, a great psychological nuance, you know. One of the great pleasures of reading Le Carre is, the, is that, uh, is that you know he's while you know the spy craft is in the background and while you know espionage is a fa- is obviously at the heart of, of events, what he's really interested in things like are institutional behavior, 
You know, it's this kind of hilarious thing that, you know, in, in the golden age of, you know, James Bond movies, that he's writing British spy stories where it's, you know, it's about petty fights within yeah, the office. The bureaucracy. And, you know, that's, yeah, bureaucracy. Yeah. And can, can, we yeah. get, can, can we get a little bit more money for this? No. <laughs> and, you know, wait, and what if we, what if we lie about what it is? Maybe we could convince them to give us money. You know, it's all this crazy stuff. And, you know, secretaries and, you know, and the role they play in the thing. You know, it's, it's, he's so interested in this, which is obviously a much broader uh, – it's something that we've all experienced, you know, anybody in modern commercial society, we've all touched it in some way, either as a customer, a customer, a competitor or, or, or an employee. And, um, and the psychological aspect of those institutions and how they behave is so interesting to him. And he, and he brings it to life so well. Um, so, yeah, I, I like that that notion of the bigger universe and how it plays out. And um, and I will continue to pursue that in my own work in some way. Yeah, we'll see if this turns into an Alexandria quartet like we were talking about yeah, before we yeah, started. Yeah, we'll see. Something. <laughs> something. Amor, hey, thanks so much for coming My pleasure. To the show. Gil, thanks for having me. And that was Amor Tolls. Both his novels, Rules of Civility and A Gentleman in Moscow, are just wonderful. So check those out. I particularly enjoy Gentleman in Moscow, but you know me. Those are the sort of things, uh, all those threads I mentioned earlier in the introduction are, well, they're right up my alley. Um, Amor also has a story in the current issue of Granta, which is number 148, the summer fiction issue. And he also has that new story in an Amazon Kindle only collection called Forward, coming out September 17th, 2019, which is this very day. It's called You Have Arrived at Your Destination. And the audible version is narrated by David Harbour of Stranger Things. So check out Amor's website, amortolls.com, to find out more about his writing, his book tours, other neat stuff. There's a, a neat video trailer for Gentlemen in Moscow. And, well, it's a really gorgeous looking site. And that's A-M-O-R-T-O-W-L-E-S dot com. There's also a sideways set of stories from Rules of Civility, a kind of spinoff of one of the characters. Um... You can find out more about it on the website. I do not have a copy of it yet. I should have asked him for one when I was at his apartment. I will order one, and I can't wait to read those. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Amor, so, who you been reading? Now, if you want to hear his answer to that, in addition to the Le Carre Smiley books, and get some extra conversation, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memory Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The second quarter 2019 episode went live this month and features an hour of book recommendations and fun conversation with Mark Allen Stamity, David Shields, Michael Carroll, Frederick Tutton, Ursi Sotoropoulos, Caitlin Foisy, Seth, Nina Bunjavac, Stephen Guarnaccia, Hugh Ryan, Bill Griffith, Boris Fishman, and Barbara Nessen. You can support the Virtual Memory Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode now that I've finally bought a sheet-fed scanner so that I can run those through a lot quicker, my secret project, which now that I'm getting a little ahead on the podcast, I might have a chance to get to, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this one at Amor's home in Manhattan, so that means $12 at the GW, 30 bucks or so for parking, another $6 for the subway, and, of course, coffee. I also picked up all the George Smiley novels by Le Carre this week in hopes of getting to them this winter. I don't expect you to subsidize my reading habit, but in a sense, you do. If you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memories show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, and coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Nick Bartosik, Buzz Carter, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizik, Fred Kish, Annie Koyama, Jonathan Kranz, Kevin Katila, Jack Lescamella, Stephen Nadler, Barbara Nessim, Jim Ottaviani, Payne Prophet, 
Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Armando Veve, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at ChimeraObscura.com slash VM. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at SoundCloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at VMSPod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memory Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. (laughs) 